five proven strategies for faster SaaS growth. Now, what's been interesting for me on my journey is it's, it's often hard to come up with one or two new talks every year and have it be something novel and unique. Um, the easiest way that I've found is build a startup, a bunch of interesting stuff happens, talk about that, pull takeaways that other people can apply. And that's been like the, the best talks that I've done over the years have been acquiring Hittail and 10xing that and validating drip and doing a little launch and growing drip and selling drip and what it was like after sale. You know, you think about it, it's a lot of stories. At a certain point, what you're doing is no longer interesting to people at MicroConf because now I run an accelerator. And if I were to tell you all the stuff we've been doing, dealing with lawyers and all the other random stuff, it's just, it's not interesting for me and I'm living it. So uh, I, love, uh, I love what I'm doing at Tiny Seed, but the, you know, the, the struggles are just a different thing. So what I decided to do is um, I talked to, I asked permission from the 10 startups that we have funded uh, with Tiny Seed in our first batch. And we're about five months into the 12 month accelerator program. And I said, hey, are you cool if I share things that are working for you? And what the, the cool part of it is now it's not just a single startup that I'm looking at, I can actually extrapolate across 10. Now, an N of 10, as you know, does not um, you know, a, a conclusive result make, but it's at least a little more information. And I can tell you, yeah, like four or five out of 10 of our companies just did this, and this is working, and here's why. And I think that's the point. I don't want to throw tactics at you. Hey, cold email, go try that. You've already heard it. But I know that cold email is not working in certain verticals, and I know that it is working in others, and I'm going to do my best to try to explain why, such that you can say, hey, maybe I should do that now, or maybe I shouldn't. You know? So a um, lot of tactics get thrown around, and uh, this is a good book, Traction by Gabriel Weinberg. But you can go through this book, and you can get 18 or 19 marketing ideas, and you can go through SaaS Marketing Essentials by Ryan Battles, and you can get 18 or 19 marketing ideas, and pretty soon, you wind up with a list that looks like this. And I've been there, and most of you are probably <laughs> there right now. And um, I had to cut a bunch off of this, uh, if you can imagine. But the idea here is my talk is not, I'm not trying to just give you this list or I'm not trying to add you know, 10 things to your list. I'm trying to help you maybe pick, take one strategy away, maybe two, that should have uh, at least a little bit of a better chance working for you. But first, it's a microconf tradition. Um, and I really liked Andy's, Andy's talk that he kind of stumbled upon the microconf tradi tradition of looping his family in. But uh, these are my three kids. This is my why. Uh, and this is why I've, you know, along with my wife, who's not in the picture, because she didn't want to make it to the rescreening of Return of the Jedi. What the? Who doesn't want to? Yeah. So we, um, they rescreened it at a, at a local theater. It was so cool. I wanted to go to Empire Strikes Back. It's the best one. Yeah? All right. Yeah. The kids wanted, they think Jedi because the Ewoks and stuff, it was, it was, it was rough. But these, these are my kids, these are my why. Um, and my other why is, I'm not sure why Princess Leia is so, she really, she was like that in all the pictures. It's like she didn't want to be there or something, but <laughs> I'm not sure. Because Princess Leia smiled in the movies, right? So, um, all right, so let's dig in. So five strategies, and then we get to go down and watch the sunset, toast the sunset. So the first strategy that several of the other companies in Tiny Seed are using is um, integration marketing. First time I ever heard someone integrating, not just for the value to the customers, but as a marketing approach, was a guy named Ruben Gomez, who runs BidSketch. And in 2009-ish, nine or 10, he integrated with Basecamp. And I was like, you run proposal software. And I guess the project management, but like, how much value is this? And he's like, you know, there's some value, but the real value is that I got them to agree to promote my landing page. And they're gonna mention it in an email. And I said, that is the best idea ever, can I steal it? And he said, yeah, of course. So we didn't really have a name for it, and it, it, obviously it's pretty simple. I said, let's just call this, I'm gonna call it integration marketing. And I started yapping about it on the podcast and stuff. But the key here is it, integrations can be super pow powerful for retention if your customers use it. Um, but integrations are one of only two marketing approaches that provide both traffic and value to your existing customers. Because if I run AdWords, I can drive traffic. That doesn't provide value to my customers. If I do uh, SEO, I can get more traffic, but it doesn't provide value. The one other marketing approach, I know you were wondering about, um, it's content marketing, bottom of the funnel content marketing. Because that can drive traffic and also educate your customers on how to use your product and be better at it. 
Um, but integration marketing is something I'm going to talk about right now, and a bunch of the founders are using it to success. So I'm going to talk through how I think about it and how I've used it to success, and then you know what's going on. During this talk, I'm going to have a couple things. I'm going to talk. I'll have like a screenshot of, of uh, one of the company's websites, and I'll explain what they do and why I think this is working for them. And I'm also going to have um, several bar graphs that I'm pulling from the sneak, sneak preview of the state of independent SaaS. So we did a survey. Uh, MicroConf sent out emails, and, and we got people to tweet it. And we did a survey, and we wound up getting 1,576 responses, which was way, I wanted five, I wanted four or 500, like I was like, that's a win. So all, now 1,576, they were not all complete. There was about 850, I think, that were total, um, meaning filled out every question, but the other 700 we can still use for the questions they filled out. So the guy, uh, we hired a statistician um, who's been doing this for 40 years, and he said when Gallup does these polls, if they hit 1,000 responses, it's 95%. Um, accuracy with plus or minus three. That's what he told me. So I'm super pleased with this. Now, obviously, you can't do causation. You can do correlation. But um, today, we'll just be doing some simple graphs that look like this. So this graph I pulled straight out of an Excel spreadsheet. This report is nowhere near. I mean, I just have like 20 graphs um, total, and I pulled a few for today. But what we did is we asked all these, these self-funded or indie-funded SaaS companies, what are the top two marketing approaches that are moving your needle today, that are driving revenue. And so you can see SEO is, what, about 17%. Content marketing, 16 and a half. Email marketing is 10%. So you see there. So integrations is way down the list. It's number six. And I think that's an interesting data point. I think either integrations are too hard to build because they require engineering time, whereas other marketing approaches don't, or um, perhaps they're not working for certain folks, because I do think there are verticals where it's hard to do it or it's just an, an underutilized form. So when I did integration marketing, um, after I, I, Ruben and I have this joke, and we say I steal all my good ideas from him, and he says that, that to me. But when I stole the idea from Ruben and started doing it, I had one integration with .NET Invoice, which is 2008 or 9. I had, did three integrations when I had Hittail, and we did 32 or 33 integrations with Drip, because it just became a channel for us. It was big, and what we did was we had five asks, and I would drop an email, either hopefully to a product person or a founder. Sometimes it was to support, and I'd be like, hey, we're going to integrate. But the asks that I would put in there, and I'd say, look, this is going to be a mutual thing. When we're done, we want to integrate with you. Our mutual customers are asking, here's what we want to do for you. Would you reciprocate? And so the asks that I had, or the gives, as you could see it, is we, you know, we want to email our list our 5,000, 10,000 person email list of you know, marketing uh, uh, list. Uh, we want to write a blog post about the integration. We want to put you in our kind of app store integrations list, which was just a bulleted list at, at a certain point on a word or on a, on a web page. Uh, we want to do an in-app mention. We want to tweet it out. Can you do those? And then what they would come back with typically is, well, we can do like three of the four or three of the five. And we'd say, cool, we'll do it. Let's, this is a, like a joint venture, you know? It's like, we'll write the code, and then let's, let's mutually kind of scratch each other's backs. The bonus, the sixth bonus, there it is, um, was a webinar. And that, I would only ask if they were really gung-ho about it, and I thought that, that it would be worth spending the time to, to hop on a webinar um, with them. Often I knew the founder or I knew the product person, because getting to webinar is, is, you know, is a big deal. So... With us, it worked well. It was at certain times for Drip was between 20 and 30 percent of our new trials in a given month. It was it was a, man, 15 to 30, I'll say, depending on what was going on. So it was very successful for us, and I'm seeing this happening in the batch, and it, it's super cool. And they may not use my exact, you know, this was kind of my playbook, um, but but one startup is called Branch. It's a SaaS app, and it's for it's like con continuous integration, continuous development for WordPress. Okay which really isn't something that's done much with WordPress. They, they tend to use general tools. And so you may have met Peter. You may have seen him here. Um, he's a continuous integration tool, right? So the way that I think about who to integrate with, which is often the next question, it's like, well, so who, who should I integrate with? Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's not. As I think about what apps come before me in a workflow and what apps come after me. So let's take Drip, email service provider. It sends emails. It's like MailChimp if, if you aren't familiar with Drip. What comes before you send them emails? Landing pages. So we integrated with Instapage and lead pages and other 
ClickFunnels, and a bunch of other landing page providers. What comes after Drip? So Drip is, is all about nurturing leads and, and getting people warmed, and then typically you want them to purchase something. So we then integrated with Stripe and PayPal and Gumroad and SendOwl and Shopify and all these shopping carts. So those were our first. Now we eventually had other, other things like spitting out into a Facebook custom audience and stuff, but those were the ones that we just went in. So Peter here runs Branch, which is CI CD for WordPress. Well, what comes after? I'm in a CI CD tool. I push the button, do your CI CD. Where does it spit that to? Well, it spits it to a web host. And so this is already live. Um, Pantheon has integrated with Peter, and the crazy thing is you might say, well, he is, he, Peter, he's you know, built all this cool stuff. He, he's just one dude, and, and Branch is fairly early stage, and Pantheon is, is one of the largest WordPress hosts. It's a very large, very well-respected, and they not only you know, said, yes, let's do the integration, but this is a blog post they published a month ago. I mean, they really, they really pushed this, so this stuff can work well. He got multiple tweets out of it, um, so I'm, I'm proud of what's going on, and he's already in discussions with multiple other um, WordPress hosts as well. Another example of this is an app called SimSass. And Matt Wensing is here, you may have seen him, he's in the back. Um, so SimSass is like, think of it this way, it's forecasting for SaaS apps. So it, you know, we, a lot of us have our metrics providers, you either write a custom dashboard or to use bare metrics, profit well or whatever to look at your metrics. And then they have a little linear extrapolation, right? But SimSass is like a very complex model um, that allows you to to do detailed forecasts. So what, in his case, what comes before SimSass? Like how does SimSass get its data? Well, it needs your MRR, your churn, it needs all that. So what were the first three integrations that, that he did? Bare metrics, profit well, chart mobile. As you would expect, because it's a huge, you know, a, a show of hands in this room, if you have a SaaS app, who uses one, two, or three of the apps that we just named for your metrics? Ooh, that's a lot fewer than I thought. Okay. Um, so anyways, the, the, the idea there too is, is Matt just didn't go and build this. He got into conversations with them at, well, one was at MicroConf, one I believe was at LTVConf or BOS. You know, he went out, he shook the hands of the founder and says, hey, I'm gonna do this. This, this is a mutual win for us, right? Because I'm gonna forecast and I know that you guys probably need forecasts and you don't wanna build it because it's really complicated. So he integrated, he's getting some, some good press there and his onboarding is now super slim. And last example for this one is Static Kit, which is, um, if you've heard of the static site movement, some folks are getting really, um, you know, WordPress can, get, can become a heavy tool if you're just trying to throw up a quick website. So there's this whole static site movement of getting stuff in flat HTML, and, um, and Static Kit provides you with the endpoints to have an email form on that. Because a static site is literally HTML, so there's no functionality. So if you want to do email capture, or you just want to, you know, uh, have a contact form, as he says, or a feedback survey. You need some functionality. So he's built that, and it's a low, right now, it's a lower end price point. But again, we sat down, we were chatting about stuff, and sh sure enough, one guy sitting coding in his, essentially in his spare bedroom, is now integrated with Zite. And there's Zite and Netlify are like the two big uh, hosts in this space. And he tweeted it, or uh, mentioned it on his podcast, and Zite's like, well, sure, we'd love to promote that. So his integration went live a few weeks ago. Now, I've shown you examples of some things that went pretty easy that worked. So this isn't always easy. If I was building an ESP today, if I was building Drip today and had no network, it would not be easy. It's very crowded. There's a ton of integrations. When I email lead pages or Instapage or Insta whatever, and, and they're Stripe, they're just like, ah, there's already a bazillion things integrated with us. So when is this easy? Well, both pulling from the models I just showed you, the examples, but also other experience I have. If you're in a new space, like static kit, it's just static sites are still an evolving technology and there just aren't that many great tools. So if you're early, it's a lot easier to do this because everyone wants to integrate. If you are bringing a new paradigm to a mature vertical, so the examples of that are SimSAS, which is a mature, it's a new paradigm, which is like forecasting is not common in what we do in smaller SaaS apps. And the mature vertical, of course, is SaaS. Uh, and same with, with branch, right? Because that's CI, CD, which is a, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's a newer paradigm for that vertical. WordPress is a mature vertical and CI, CD is new to it. If you have a good network, everything gets easier. Uh, if you have a large customer marketing list, everything gets easier because then you just have it to trade. Um, 
And the other last one is if it bridges a gap. For a larger company and fits a whole, the best one you can hear about, man, is if you know of someone inside a large host or a large uh, uh, SaaS app and they're like, customers just keep asking us for this and we just, we're not gonna build it or we can't build it or it's too much time and you happen to be able to build it, like that's a killer thing because then they'll slot you in, they'll recommend you, they'll write the blog post because it, it, it solves a pay point for them and ultimately if, if being acquired is something you want to do, not for everyone, but if it's something you want to do, this is how you start doing that. You know, you lock in there and pretty soon they're like, wait a minute, he's doing this for four or five web hosts. I only want to do it for us. So um, that's the end of that one. That's the longest one of the, of the afternoon, by the way. And since I talk fast and I don't tell jokes during my talks, I um, have a couple short intermissions just to kind of mix things up so I can take a drink of this straight vodka, I mean water here. And this child will be telling the jokes for me. They're not good. You're in a concrete room with a saw and a table. What do you do? I don't know. What do I do? The answer is, you saw the table in half, two halves make a hole, climb out the hole. Wait for it. You're in a concrete room with a table and a mirror. How do you get out? I don't know. How do I get out? You look into the mirror, you see what you saw, you grab the saw, you saw the table in half, two halves make a hole, you climb out the hole. This guy's got swagger. So, aside from him wearing a shirt that yeah, that's, Ladies and gentlemen, Finn Walling, I will tell him, I'll tell him you applauded. He, um, he is now 13, and we'll hear from him a little later, too. Uh, but he's wearing a shirt that's not very uh, TV friendly, I just, I just noticed. Okay, let's cover the next two uh, before that next intermission. I know you I'm looking forward to the intermission, so I think y'all are too. So strategy two is cold email. And this is like I mentioned early on, like I'm not gonna sit here and tell you do cold email, we all know that, but like when, when is it working and when do we think it's not? The thing is, is all these tactics, especially traffic driving tactics, they have a half-life. They work for a while and then everyone does it and then they work less or it gets really hard to do it. SEO, organic search is gonna work let's assume forever, assuming Google doesn't just have 10 AdWords and push us to the second page like it feels like they're gonna do. But realistic, realistically, it just gets harder and harder, right? That's, that's what I mean by this. It is the same exact tactics that I used to rank in 2006. They don't work anymore, unfortunately. Um, so things like you know, keyword stuffing in your footer, remember when this worked? That was, that was fun. And then uh, hub pages, Squidoo. Anyone ever post an article to any of these places? Yeah, I, I, was, I knew Alex would raise his hand, yeah. <laughs> Anyone ever post 500 spun articles to the, yeah. <laughs> so this was stuff that used to work and it frankly just stopped overnight because they stopped their algorithm. But there's a whole list of stuff that has worked for a while and then it just becomes less and less effective. And I think of, you know, plutonium, uranium, these, these uh, radioactive things, they, they have a half-life of like, in a million years, it'll, it'll be half as, if, half as radioactive, and another million, it's a quarter, another million, it's an eighth, and blah, blah, blah. So in startups, it's a little shorter than that. It's not a million years, it might be two, three years. So this is a list I threw up, um, wait, threw up? That was a weird thing. This is a list I, uh, I had on a slide at my MicroConf talk six months ago in the US, and I walked through it all, and I, I won't do that here, because it's not the point, but I was just, that going back through my notes and podcasts and I was thinking about approaches and when they came across my radar kind of in our community. And so you can see like split testing. I did a talk at BOS actually in 2008 and people were like, split testing, what is this thing? You know, And it wasn't that it didn't exist because internet marketers and info marketers were using it, but startups, we just weren't thinking about it that way. And email marketing became popular and VAs and all that, but you can see the first time I heard about cold email and first time I got a cold email was early 2012. Now, I really realized predictable revenue came out, I think, in late 2011. So it's not as if, you know, it didn't exist before then. But um, that's really when I, from 2012 over the next couple of years, I just, I think we all saw it ramp up big time. And I would argue it's less effective today than it was seven years ago, as most tactics are. And so in the marketing categories, back to that same screenshot I showed you earlier, cold email is still number four. It's at about nine, eight or nine percent, it looks like. So where is cold email working today in the companies that I know of? In my N of 10, that should expand. Hopefully next year it's 20 or, 20 or 30, so I should maybe be able to make these, these talks even, you know, even better. But one place it's working is with a SaaS app called Gather. And as you can see, visual spec 
management for interior designs and architects. And they're sending cold emails, and they, I don't remember what the exact numbers were, but tripled, quadrupled the number of demos they're getting. And now they're working on you know, trying to close those. Um, so it's working for them. Client Rock, which a lot, a lot of you may know uh, Brian Marble, who's been a multi-time uh, microconf attendee. And this is for lawyers. So it's intake for lawyers, and he's sending emails, he's getting people on the phone, and then trying to figure out you know, what to build to, to make them happy. And Reimbi um, is another one. I had David Heller on the podcast, uh, what was it, once or twice? I had him on the podcast once to talk about enterprise sales and the struggles he was having. Um, and they're actually doing quite well, but his struggle was trying to you know, cut the lead time of, of enterprise sales. And cold email's working for them. So we do have three examples here of, of places where it's working pretty well. So the, as I talk to these folks and I talk, there are other people in the batch who are trying and it's not working, right? It's just, you're not getting the ROI. And the, big, the biggest thing I see is, if everyone's already inundated with it, it's not working. So are you in a vertical? where everyone's getting a bunch of email, maybe, maybe lower this on your priority list. If you're in a vertical like architects, maybe you're lucked out on this one. You know, cold email can, can be the thing. And it's amazing when you have five or 10,000 total addressable market, uh, to five or 10,000 companies in the, in the US or in you know, the world, because you can just, you can get that list pretty easy in, in email. So maybe use blue tick. So strategy number three is pricing. And it's been crazy how many pricing conversations we've had in the batch. We do weekly calls, and it just seems like every week, every other week, there's some, some conversation about raising, reworking, figuring out what's working and what's not. And I'm not just going to say raise your prices, although I am going to first say raise your prices. But um, we've had a company in the batch do that twice in the first five months, and they're thinking about doing it a third time. And so back to Gather, which I just mentioned, interior spec management. So when they joined the, the cohort, within the first month, I did a call with, with them, Brian and Scotty, who, who run it. And their pricing was 39 bucks for the cheapest. And it went up from there. And I was like, no, dude, 39, this is not, this is not enough, guys. You know? And you're always nervous, because it's like, well, we get some pricing objections. They were, they were serving kind of a lower end of the market, where they were individuals. And so, they raised it, I believe, up to 79, and they realized that while the solo founders were kind of moving away, the, it, was a, it was a signal that the tool was better. And so they started you know, moving up market. They had to build more features and such. Then they raised it again. So now their lowest one is 99. And we were just talking. We had a little short, tiny seed retreat before MicroConf. And he was like, I think I'm going to double it. I want our bottom end price to be 200 bucks, maybe 250. And so they're going to try it again. And this is a kind of thing of, it's risky, it's super scary, it's super stressful. But when it works, you know, you think about, let's say they'd never touch their pricing, 40 bucks versus 200 bucks if they make it, and it's a 5X. So you could be at 2K MRR, you could be at 10K MRR. It's like a huge, huge, massive leverage here. So if you have never raised your prices, it's a microconf meme at this point, but you know, one example of folks who are still ratcheting that up. The other thing, though, that I don't think we talk about enough with pricing is just reworking that pricing. So um, again, an example, this company called Loadster, uh, and it's run by Andy here. You'll note him. He's one of the few people here who's taller than me. I think he's like 6'6". Six, six. And it's uh, load testing for web apps. So you sign up for Loadster, you have your app, and you, you say, all right, point it at this thing and try to take my website down and see where it fails, right, before I go live with it. And so when he joined the batch, he has, he has great price points. So if you can't see it, it's like $300 for the low end, $600,000, and then let's talk. Those are great price points. His churn is, is quite high. And the reason is that people sign up for load testing, they load test for two months, and then they say, oh, I'm not going to need this again until I put another site live. So they cancel. Some people do it throughout the year, but other teams don't. So he was noodling on it, and he, had some, he already had some ideas about it, but in the last uh, five months, he's um, tweaked his pricing, and he now has Loadster Fuel, which is basically pay-as-you-go. And it's a trip. If you look at MailChimp, they have pay-as-you-go. And Campaign Monitor used to. I don't know if they still do. But it's pay-as-you-go, and that's a, almost anathema to MRR and SaaS, right? We don't, it's like, I don't know what I want the one time. So far, this, is, this experiment is, is working for him. And now he introduced this third Thing. And you can see there's tabs at the top, right? The unlimited are on the right. That's just the SaaS I showed you first. And then loads to fuel is there. And these fuel plans basically are, are like T-Mobile. Like they carry over your minutes. 
So you pay 79 bucks a month for 1,000 instead of 119 for 1,000, so it's cheaper. And if you don't use it all, it just carries over and your balance gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as long as you're a customer, you keep it. So it's creative, right? We don't, we don't see this often. And the big, when he brought it to the batch and, and, and Einar and myself, and we were like, that's like 12 pricing tiers. Like this is complicated. Are people gonna wander off? And that was the, and we said, look, and he, he was on an agreement, like, let me push this live and I'm gonna put hot jar or whatever and I'm gonna see what the conversion rates are like. And if it works, uh, I'm cool, and if it doesn't, I'm gonna undo it. You know, I'm gonna have the, the un, undo command Z on my server, and I'm gonna go back to you know, just the basics. So, so far it's working, it is still early, but love the creativity in thinking about how to get people, you know, if your app has high churn, how do you get them to maybe have a different paradigm around it? The other one, um, last example on, on this pricing thing is an app called Popsicle. And it's after school registration software. And I love, we love this vertical because who in their right mind would go, go into this? I'll talk about why he went into it uh, later. But when, when he joined the batch, yeah, when he, uh, you think even the first month of the batch, he had just flat pricing, it was 3% for everyone. And that worked really well. He was serving public schools and there's reasons this works that I don't have time to go into, but 3%. And within the first month he was like, because we said we love that 3% model because the schools don't have to pay anything out of pocket. Because getting schools to approve budgets, super hard. It takes a year, it takes all this stuff. The first thing he did was he's like, all right, so I'm gonna have a $99 a month minimum, and I'm gonna do a $1 per child, and I'm gonna have a small transaction fee of half a percent. That's the subtitle there. And I freaked out, and I was like, what? But I, your whole model, it's a 3% thing. That, you know, there's no budget needed. And he had thought it through, he, we talked for an hour, and he, he's like, here's what I thought, and I kind of tried to poke holes at it, and he said, you know, I'm really, we're getting a lot of private schools, and the private schools actually like this model better for reasons that aren't that important, but he knew his customer, and he actually saw his customer base shifting, and he saw more opportunity here, and he had to rework his pricing, and that, this has been a success for him. So that's number three. Last intermission, same kid. Here we go. I was looking at a box of Ticonderoga pencils and it said the world's best pencil on the outside. So I was wondering how can they be number one if they're always number two? <laughs> number two pencils, remember? All right, he made it up. I know it wasn't very good. He also had one, uh, he had one about microconf that was funny that I didn't include. He made it up too. What is the bacterial founder? What conference do they like? And I was like, I don't know what microconf because bacteria is small, but what's a bacterial, he missed the angle that it has to mean something, you know? All right, strategy four, <laughs> and uh, I promise these will get shorter. Um, reducing sign up friction, this was something that, that it's interesting to be <laughs> launching startups and involved with startups for as long as I have because my stance used to be very strong and I was very opinionated about always asking for a credit card up front and my stance on that is changing. It's lucky I'm not a politician or people would like quote me back to myself. But um, so again, back to that state of independent SaaS, we said excluding freemium, like a forever free plan, do you offer a free trial? And so 60, was that 64% said yes. It's like, okay, so then there's another 20% that is freemium, so it's about, eight, let's say 84%, you can try the software for free without paying, basically. The trippy part that I did not expect is 73% of them do not ask for a credit card in advance. I wish we were doing this survey 10 years ago because I think this would have been flipped. Everybody asked for a credit card at one point and then it just slowly, the barriers drop. Now it's not in every space and it's not, you know, you get the caveats, but this is a trend and I'm, I'm curious to see, we're gonna do the state of independent SaaS every year and I wanna, I'm curious to see how these things change. So, removing the credit card for free, free trial, if I was still running Drip today, if I was launching a SaaS today, I would personally seriously, seriously consider not having a credit card. And this comes from someone who I can point to a bazillion times on a podcast where I've said, my default is always ask for the credit card. And I, I'm at the point where I actually think reducing the friction and owning the lead is, is more important. One example, Castos, many of you know Craig Hewitt from the Rogue Startups podcast. He's part of the Tiny Seed Batch. He runs podcast hosting. And they, up until 48 days ago, if I'm doing my math correctly, it was September 2nd. Um, I don't even know what day it is. But yeah, so uh, as of September 2nd, they removed their credit card. And he, the interesting thing is it's a lot of work to do that, as he experienced. You don't just hide the credit card page. Um, 
because you have to rework onboarding, you have to rework, oh, you're at the end of your trial, I can't just say, hey, it's about to charge, it's now in your credit card, you have to prompt them, you have to, so there's a bunch of stuff. It's not trivial to do this. But he did it, and he was, frankly, pretty, as I would be, nervous about it, you know, anxious about it. So if you're gonna do it, here's kind of the, how I'm, how I'm seeing it pan out, and how I've seen it pan out for years, frankly. Because with Drip, we had, we didn't remove the credit card, but we had, uh, we asked for your email address and password, and then we had a credit card form, and they were two separate steps. And we saw about 50, it depended on the traffic, but it was around 50 to 60% dropped off when they saw the credit card. So I knew that we could double our number of trials if we drop you know, the credit card requirement. That many more people would have made it in. Now, more of them would have been unqualified, but that's, that's kind of the point. So my experience, two to three X your trial count when you do this but now it's on you to activate them. Because if you don't activate them, they don't automatically extend their trial, which is essentially what, if you ask for credit card up front and they don't activate and they get to the end of their 14 day, 30 day and they get charged, and they haven't activated, they're kind of just extending their trial as a, as a paid trial, really. And I do this sometimes where it's like, ah, it's 20 bucks, I'm just gonna do it, it gives me another 30 days and now I'm gonna come back to it. In this case, it's not. Getting them activated, they're just not gonna enter their card, you know, because they don't wanna, it's, it's too much effort. This tactic is exceptional if your primary user does not have a credit card. So selling to developers is one example. Um, and it's developers on teams of 20 people. Well, developers wants to get started with your little CI CD tool or your little, you know, whatever you have, and they don't have a credit card, their boss does, or their boss's boss does. And they're not gonna go around asking for that. So in this case, actually, there's a lot there. There's, I think there's a lot of leverage in this particular case, and it, as I've already said, I think it becomes table stakes if most of your competition especially isn't asked for it. Like if you look around and six out of 10, seven out of 10 of your competition isn't, it's time to start thinking, how, where, where is this puck going? You know, it, the market's gonna get there, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna stay ahead of it? This was the forever free plan one because uh, I also think freemium is becoming more popular. So about 20% have forever free. And it doesn't mean forever free, I mean no time limit. I mean, you, it can be a usage-limited trial, like, you know, you can upload X amount of podcasts, or you can, you know, it's like, it, it, it expires at some point based on, on stuff, but uh, 20%. So freemium, which I know um, several founders doing it, Ruben from BidSketch is now launching DocSketch, and he's doing freemium. I know Heaton Shaw is doing FYI, and there are uh, two, or no, there are three companies in our batch that are about to do it. Actually, there are four. But since they haven't done it, I don't want to talk about it because it's kind of a, <laughs> a competitive thing they're doing. Um, if you're going to do freemium, here's, here's the tough part with freemium. I also think the puck eventually is going to get here. These trends just change. Um, but if I was a SaaS developer trying to quit my day job, I wouldn't do freemium from the start unless everyone else was doing it because it's a, it's a long-term play. You, you're, just, you're pushing revenue down the line. And if you need that 8K or that 10,000 you know, euro or dollars to quit, <laughs> Fastest way to get there, I think, is to, is to not do freemium, but the longer term view, you'll get more revenue you know, over time. Activation, of course, remains crucial. Patrick Campbell from ProfitWell says, the beauty of freemium is you own the lead because now they're in your software and they're gonna hang out until they activate, as opposed to next time they look for it, oh, my trial expired, well now I'm gonna go back to the whole, you know, all your competitors and figure out who's the best. If they already have the thing, you know, the account in your app, you own the lead, essentially. It is also, unfortunately, easier to do early because when we went to freemium with Drip, we, luckily we had been acquired by a venture back company because we went to a $1 plan and then we went to a free plan and it nuked 20K of MRR, just wiped it off because people dropped down. And that's, that's a bummer, you know? And it wasn't something I could stomach as a bootstrapper myself, but um, this is where it's easier to do early. And when we went freemium, it, if I recall, it's, it was around three, four X our trial count, which was already pretty substantial. Okay, home stretch here, strategy five is a question mark. A weird, it's a backwards S question mark. And the font is like, the, the inter fascinating thing is I was looking at this list and I was saying, what has everyone been doing? What have they been working on? What's their big struggle? What's the big challenge? What have we been advising them on? Eight out of 10 founders, have done this. Eight out of 10, so there were nine, well not, all, there were almost 900 applicants to Tiny Seed, the first batch. And we picked 10. And so I'd like to think that these 10 are pretty, that they're going places, you know, that, they, that we have some like success 
in, in store for them, right, that we, that we picked pretty well. And eight out of 10 of them, and I could argue nine or 10 out of 10 of them, they built on past experience. This is not the first app in, their, in this sphere. This is not the first time they're using this knowledge. And I'm gonna walk you through, I don't even know, five or six examples. Um, branch, all these we've already seen, but Branch, remember again, it's con uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment for WordPress. Well, Peter also has a WordPress plugin that he built before this, it's called WP Pusher, which is just deployment. It's not continuous, it's totally different. It's not a SaaS app, but he has an audience, he has revenue, he has a bunch of stuff that he then was like, wait a minute, I'm just gonna parlay that, and you know, blah, 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 and so now Branch. He's not going in cold. If I were to try to build Branch, I wouldn't have any of the stuff he has. Matt was SimSaaS. So Matt's prior startup was called Risk Pulse. And guess what it was? It was forecasting for uh, weather and logistics. So you can imagine a huge company like Walmart has all these trucks going all over and weather is a catastrophe for them, right? It knocks you know, a truck over, or like you can't drive on the road or whatever. So it predicts the weather and it predicts where you should be where. Well, you know, where you should be when. And it's successful, it's a multi seven figure SaaS app that he now has a, a CEO running. And so he took that forecasting knowledge I'm gonna do it for SaaS now, right? Same thing. So I imagine, again, let's say I was gonna start SimSaaS. I would be at a severe disadvantage because I don't know the core, you know, I could learn it, but I'm gonna be a year behind Matt, if not more, because of the learnings. He's building on his experience. Gather, husband and wife team. And the husband is, is Brian, and he's a UX designer developer. Wife is, was an interior designer worked at the interior design. So she took her knowledge, they put it into the app, so they would have an advantage. You know, each of these things is like, what's your advantage here, right? Client Rock, Brian, Brian's wife is a lawyer, but also he started Amaze Law, which is a SaaS app in the legal space. Built it up, sold it for a small exit a couple years ago, now he's building another one. Popsicle, why would you go into this space? Well, Gary, the founder, started one of the largest um, after-school management uh, companies, basically services in Los Angeles, and he franchised it. So he built up this whole business, sold it, and he was building software inside of it at the time, I believe, and because there was no software for this, as you can imagine. And then he wound up selling that, and he's like, well, I'm gonna go do this now. So he has that advantage. Craig with Castos, if you heard him on the podcast recently, you know, you're seeing the pattern. It's like Craig had a podcast. He had a WordPress plugin for podcasts. He has a productized service that edits and publishes podcasts. Should I build a SaaS app or should I go build a SaaS app for lawyers? You know, it's like he, you have all this stuff. And this, to be honest, was a big mistake. Yeah, no, that wouldn't be good. Big mistake I made early on is if you look at my early days, I had all these disparate apps that I owned and none of them tied together. And it wasn't until I was like, hey, I'm gonna do Hittail and parlay my SEO knowledge. And then I'm gonna do Drip, which parlayed my email marketing knowledge and you know this community that I built. And now, and that was successful. And now it's like, why, well, why do you think I'm doing Tiny Seat? because it, it just it fits that. I'm building on my own experience as well, helping founders, building communities, trying to ra rise the, raise the tide of all of us. Um, so a couple more slides. The, um, back to the State of Independent SaaS Survey. We asked, have you, I forget the exact word in the question, but it was like, have you started, you've told us a bunch of metrics about your current SaaS app. Have you started a prior company or pro like a software product. And almost 60% said yes. And the thing I was, um, which, which is cool, more than half, but the thing I was surprised by is if you add up, so this is the revenue of like your prior company, how much revenue did it achieve, right? So 15% started one, but it never got any revenue. So, um, but for between 10,000 and a million monthly revenue for their prior company, um, I added this up the other day and it's, I don't, it was like 50 something percent. So it's a substantial amount of folks are coming back and at the bat again. And that's where I say often like, don't go into this thinking in terms of weeks and months, like this is a long journey, like think in terms of years. And I think that's evidenced both by the, you know, the, the batch founders that I've shown you, but also by these folks that I'm seeing from, from the independent SaaS uh, survey. So, why do I think this matters? Why do I think building on experience is important? So it comes back, I have a stair-step approach where I say you build the small thing and you parlay it and you build up, build up. Why is that helpful? And so I came up with this terrible acronym called SANER, 
because it's more sane to do it that. I don't know why. It's just, it works with the numbers. So this is exactly what I <laughs> experienced and what I've seen other founders, for the most part, experience. When I was trying to get started as a developer in 2005 and trying to build my own stuff, I was super like not self-confident about it. I didn't want rejection. I didn't want it to fail. And as I had these little successes along the way, it built self-confidence in me that I could do it and that I could make 1,000 a month and then I could make 3,000 a month and then 4,000. So self-confidence. You can build an audience, much like Branch and Push, WP Pusher, right? Now he has however many thousands of downloads of a WordPress plugin. You have your audience. Same with Craig, with Castos. He has an audience that can feed into it. You build your network. Network's super important. As I said, if you have a good network, you could start Drip today. But if you don't, and get all the integrations and stuff, if you don't, it's, it's a lot harder. Experience just making decisions, getting your gut better, and hopefully some runway. If you've done one, two, or three of them, get a little money, get a little revenue, and dollars in the bank always makes it easier. So, saner. I gotta, someone help me with that and make that better. <laughs> so, anyways, um, I think pretty soon, oh yeah, it's almost beach time. It's almost beach o'clock, and I, for one, I'm gonna enjoy the sunset with a little beer in hand, but um, that's it for me today. Thank you for listening.